Hi class, this is part one um, of the chapter on voice disorders, chapter 11, but this should be the fourth video you are watching um, this week for this week's lecture. So as promised, I am going to go through the terms that I provided you um, in written form on titanium. Just quickly through these definitions. I know you can read them yourself, but I just want to go through them in case there's any explanation I think needs to be tied to them. So the first is just the definition of voice. Voice is that complex dynamic product of vocal fold vibration that allows us to vocalize and verbalize. So the difference between vocalization is just sound, verbalization is um, words over that sound. So voice is essential for speech, <clears throat> but it is also a tool for personal expression, for creativity, for art. Um, the term adduction is when the vocal folds come together. And the term abduction is when the vocal folds, folds are at rest in the open position. Resonance is the vibration of air within the whole pharyngeal column. Frequency. This term and um, the term intensity we'll talk to again in the chapters on hearing. Frequency is the rate of vocal fold vibration expressed as cycles per second. So in terms of voicing, that's not the same definition as we'll use for hearing um, or for sound, but um, the rate of vocal fold vibration, cycles per second, and it is expressed in the term Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z. It's a physical measurement that we perceive as pitch. Fundamental frequency. This is the arithmetic mean of the rate of vibration of the vocal folds. So if we're looking at that uh, measurement of cycles per second, this is the average or the arithmetic mean. So this changes based on each individual. So your average kindergarten student um, has um, a fundamental frequency of about 250. An adult woman, it's between 180 to 220. An adult man, it's usually between 120 to 140. Um, so you see we're expressing fundamental frequency frequency as pitch. So you can see kindergartners have a much higher pitched voice than the average woman um, who has a slightly higher pitched voice than the average man. Um, fundamental frequency can change in an individual person with age because of physical growth, because of changes in the length and mass of the vocal folds. The term intensity is the physical measurement of sound pressure or decibels and correlates with what we perceive as loudness. Now we, we have talked about this before and we'll talk about it again in the chapters on hearing. Um, intensity is determined by how far the vocal folds separate laterally and how quickly they come back together in each vibratory cycle. Two factors impact that. One, the amount of airflow from the lungs and the amount of resistance to that airflow by the vocal folds. Phonatory quality. This is how well the two vocal folds work during that vibratory cycle. Now this is something that we aren't measuring by some kind of numerical measurement, but this is described in words like mellow or rich harmonious, velvety, reedy, whispery, whiny, harsh, shrill, flat. So this is quality descriptors of how voice sounds. Okay, so those are our terms from the sheet. Voice is considered disordered when its pitch, its loudness, or its quality differs significantly from that of persons of similar age, gender, cultural background, racial or ethnic group. Um, it must be serious enough to draw attention or to detract in some way. 
So many people have significantly distinctive voices, but that does not make them disordered. So think about, I'm going to try and think about personalities that you might have, um, you might be aware of. Um, Fran Drescher, the woman who plays the nanny on the television show, The Nanny. And I know um, that's before a lot of you were born, but I, it's been around for a long time. She has a very distinctive vocal quality. It's very hyper nasal sounding on top of her New York accent. Um, it's not really considered a disorder. Can it detract? Can it draw attention? Certainly, um, but not so much that we would call it disordered. Um, Bill Clinton had a very harsh, has a very harsh kind of sounding voice. Um, harsh, not in a, oh man, he's, he's a really harsh kind of person, but harsh just in the quality of his voice. It's breathy and strident sounding. Now, his could be because of vocal disorder, um, but again, it's just a very distinct vocal quality. So difference, again, is not disorder. Disorder is when attention is called in a very negative way um, and the current vocal quality detracts from the person's ability to function in society in a way that they want or a way that they always have. So I'm going to give you another example that I hope you will all know who I'm talking about. Julie Andrews. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with her name, Julie Andrews is the original Mary Poppins. She is the original Maria in The Sound of Music. Um, she is um, Princess Diaries. She's Grandma, the Queen in Princess Diaries. Um, Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews' voice, if you were to hear her today in her speaking voice, sounds perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable. You'd think there's nothing wrong with her voice. But she answers the question the way, or she is defined by the disorder of the way they always have been. Um, Julie Andrews is one of the most famous singers in the world, um, has a, a vocal range that spans about three octaves. Um, we'll talk about what octaves are in a minute if you don't, if you're not familiar with music. Um, however, um, vocal nodules damaged her vocal folds so much that she can no longer sing in the way she always had. She has a singing range now of about six notes. Um, that's very different than the three octave range that she had previously. So you can see defining vocal disorders, except for when they are because of a physical issue, can be pretty tricky. A couple other terms that are not on that first page, dysphonia. Um, a lot of our spelling of um, medically related words uh, is based on Latin definite Latin terms. So we spell things in different ways. Dysphonia, D-Y-S-P-H-O-N-I-A. Dysphonia is just the word that means a disordered voice, Disor a disordered voice. And then aphonia, A-P-H-O-N-I-A, is a total loss or lack of ability to produce a voice, aphonia. A few more terms here related to vocal fold functioning. Hypo functioning. Whenever something starts with hypo, you know it's going to mean less than. Hypo functioning. This is under functioning of the voice. There is not adequate enough tension um, in the vocal folds. They don't come together evenly, so they allow air to escape during vocalization far more than we want to escape. We can describe the quality of hypofunction as breathy or hoarse even. Um, it can, hypofunction can affect just one vocal fold or both. Hyperfunction. Now, whenever you start something with hyper, it means too much. So hyperfunction. The vocal folds are now overly tense. They're compressing together too tightly. The, the voice may be too high pitched. It must be, it might be too loud. Um, it's definitely going to sound strained. Um, not strange, but strained. There may be excessive neck and jaw tension associated with hyperfunction. Another term is diplophonia, D-I-P-L-O-P-H-O-N-I-A. This means double pitch. Each vocal fold has a slightly different mass and therefore it's vibrating at a very different 
rate. Now, there's another kind of diplophonia in which a person is also able to utilize the false vocal folds. Um, and you could do a YouTube search of that and um, hear it. It's kind of interesting. But in our case, what we're meaning is that each fold has a different mass, so it vibrates at a slightly different rate. So you hear almost two pitches in a person's voice. And then the terms laryngectomy and alaryngeal communication. Laryngectomy is the surgical removal of the vocal fold. Remember, we save lives before we worry about speech and voice um, and communication. So laryngectomies happen most often because of cancer of the larynx, um, but they also could happen if there's um, just severe enough damage because of uh, some accident. Um, and then they result in a laryngeal communication. So communicating without the benefit of having voice. So there has to be another way to communicate. The terms prevalence and incidence we covered in our last um, section on fluency, but we're going to talk about what they mean here for voice. Uh, prevalence and incidence are relatively high in both children and adults. The most common cause of a vo adult voice disorders is vocal nodules. Um, um, the next most common list of causes are things like edema. Edema just means swelling or inflammation, uh, vocal polyps, um, vocal cancers, vocal fold cancers, and vocal fold paralysis. Um, in 10% of the cause, uh, vocal disorders, the cause is unknown. That's a pretty small percentage um, compared to many other of the disorders we talk about. I can tell you right now, I probably have a slight bit of edema going on with my vocal folds because this is the fourth video I've made in the last few hours and my voice is tired. Um, so you're hearing some um, gravel kind of sound in my voice, some breathiness. Um, in that case, I know the cause. So people in some professions report much higher degrees of voice disorder than others. And I'm sure that you could guess what those professions are. So 25 to 30 percent of the general population reports voice disorder at some point in their lifetime, sometimes at multiple points. 58 to 60 percent of teachers report voice disorder at some point in their lifetime. Some of those other professions that report high degrees of voice disorders are actors, singers, pastors, um, and teachers, obviously, people who have to use their voice for their living. Voice disorders in children. <clears throat> Four to six percent of children present with voice disorder at some point in their lifetime. Um, that's a pretty high number for little little kids. The most common cause is vocal nodules. Vocal nodules are a kind of a callus-like um, raised spot on the vocal folds. Um, and they're caused by exactly the same reason we might get callus on our hands. They're caused by that repeated um, overuse of that part of your hand. And in the case of the vocal folds, it's vocal abuse. It's the, the little the little kid who does a lot of screaming and yelling or crying or super loud laughing. Um, there's all kinds of other um, loud overuse of the voice that can lead to vocal nodules. Again, more boys than girls. Um, and that really is a gender role kind of thing. It's not true of every boy and it's not true of every little girl. But little boys tend to um, be louder and overuse their voice much more. Um, vocal nodules typically caused by some um, psychological or social factors like anger and anxiety, distractibility, frustration, loud talking, just loud use of the voice. But they can be caused by things like reflux. Um, I'll get to back to that in a little bit. Low blood circulation, dehydration, laryngeal tension. Um, so this is talking about vocal nodules now. Reflux. Um, you wouldn't think of reflux as impacting the vocal cords um, because if you remember your anatomy, reflux is acid that's coming up from the stomach into the esophagus, right? 
Um, so the reflux that is most common that we hear about in um, adolescents and adults is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disorder. And that is true. Uh, acid just coming up into the esophagus, sometimes into the um, pharyngeal area, but not, not usually any more than that. It's painful, causes heartburn. But there is a type of reflux called laryngeal pharyngeal reflux, where that acid comes up and then drips back down into the larynx and um, causes edema on the vocal folds. <clears throat> um, can be treated in much the same way as um, GERD, either by change in diet or use of medications. In some cases, a surgical intervention is necessary. Okay, so that was voice disorders in children. Um, and with a little carryover to adults with the uh, reflux issue. Prevalence and treatment. The rate of incidence among children is very, very high for vocal nodules for voice disorders, but most of the time it goes undiagnosed and untreated. So let's answer the question why that is. One reason is access. Um, the most common place for children to receive any kind of therapy related to communication is through the schools. And children must qualify for services through schools based on education code to receive that support at school. Education code says that this must be having a negative academic impact. Very, very rarely does a uh, voice disorder like vocal nodules have a negative academic impact. Um, therefore, that access point is um, eliminated. Also, um, access because of the need for medical support or medical clearance to treat in the schools. This is the only disorder this is, the, this is true for, but to treat in the schools, we must have a medical clearance. So I sometimes get a referral for voice, a child with a voice issue, and I meet with the parents and I discuss it, but then I have to say to them, before I even will do an assessment on your child, I need you to... Um, take them and have the doctor evaluate this first. And the reason we do that is there is a very tiny percentage of children who also could have cancer of the vocal folds or some other very significant medical issue. Um, and we need to know that before I would ever lead a parent to believe that I can treat this and take care of it for them. They have to have medical clearance. It's the only time really in the public schools that we do that. We have to word it very carefully. Um, because anytime we say to a parent, this must happen for your child as part of a school system process, the school is, is responsible for paying for that. So what I always do is explain to the parent, this is more likely, this is the very likely, this is caused by vocal overuse um, by your child. The parent usually agrees with me because I describe what that means. Um, and then I explain to them that, um, you know, I... Ethically, I can't treat this. They probably don't even need treatment in the public schools for this, but you need to have it. You know, next time you go to a well child visit with your doctor, why don't you discuss it with them? And um, very rarely do I get any referrals back from a doctor once in a while, but very rarely. So the other reason kids don't um, get the treatment they need um, is because just of lack of information regarding voice disorders in general or misinformation. Voice disorders will not disappear spontaneously. There has to be some fundamental change in how the child is using their voice. So it might go away as a child gets a little older and is calmer and maybe doesn't um, do as much screaming and yelling, um, but it's not going to go away just because... Um, we want it to. There has to be some fundamental change in vocal use. Another reason um, that voice disorders go untreated, um, not just in children, but also in adults, is because of social perceptions. A breathy quality voice, um, I'm going to give you some examples, can be considered very attractive. I want you to think about some female actresses especially, but even male actors, that um, have very breathy voice. Um, so I'm thinking of older actresses, some of you may not know, but Lauren Bacall, um, 
very breathy vocal quality. Marilyn Monroe had a very breathy vocal quality. They probably both had vocal nodules um, that were left untreated. Um, and it was, you know, neither of them were singers, um, so they didn't need that quality of voice. Um, but the social perception can be that this is an attractive quality. And then I'm going to add one that the book does not talk about, and that's fear or denial. Um, and this is true of many disorders um, unrelated to speech. Um, I, I know there's a symptom. I know this is unusual, but I'm not going to go to the doctor because, you know, if I go to the doctor, I might hear bad news. Um, very bad reason for not addressing the issue. But fear and denial are certainly something that play into why they go unaddressed. Some classification of voice disorders. The first classification is by etiology, by cause. Um, the most common cause, as I've already said, is vocal abuse. So this is the chronic or intermittent overuse or misuse of the vocal apparatus. So for example, talking in noisy environments. Another group of people who have high incidence of voice disorders are um, the wait, waiter staff of um, clubs or bars, um, casinos, anywhere where it's a very noisy environment and they're having to talk over those um, things. Bartenders. Um, vocal abuse can be coughing or clearing the throat frequently. So people with allergies um, can um, present with vocal abuse related to that constant coughing and clearing of the throat. Overuse of caffeine products, by the way, and I know that that kind of, again, doesn't make sense because when we're swallowing, we're not um, swallowing through the larynx, right? Shouldn't be affecting the vocal cords, but caffeine is very, very dehydrating on all of the tissues in the body. So extreme use of caffeine products can result or can be abusive to the vocal cords. In your book on page 364, um, I'm going to read you right out of your book, something I tried not to do too often. I know um, I do work from the book a lot, but I'm going to read you this description of a cough from your textbook because I think that, um, one, the writer of our textbook is a frustrated um, poet in some, in some ways, but also because this is just such an amazing description of how abusive a cough is. So here we go. The tissues of the larynx are tossed about as though caught in a hurricane. The arytenoid cartilages are in chaotic and frenzied motion, matched by the turbulent actions of the vocal folds. It's impossible to watch this coughing episode without realizing how vulnerable laryngeal tissues are to this and other forms of abuse. So vocal abuse, most common cause. Vocal abuse results in a few different types of disorder. The first is vocal, vocal nodules. These are small, um, often bilateral. They don't have to be bilateral, though they can be on just one vocal fold. Small protuberances or calloused growths on the inner edges of the vocal folds. Um, they can be acute, meaning they happen after um, one big period of vocal abuse and then um, through treatment or vocal rest go away and they never happen again. Or they can be chronic, meaning they appear and they stay there or they come back over and over again. They are the body's response to an irritant, in this case, hard contact of the vocal folds. Um, because of these um, calluses, let's use the word callus, that's what they're most like, um, the vocal folds cannot have seamless contact. And I'm trying to use my hands like I was in class in front of you, but the vocal folds cannot come together seamlessly. There's something in the way um, of that seamless connection. The vocal quality here will be breathy and hoarse sounding. Um, the next um, disorder that could present itself because of vocal abuse is contact ulcers and granulomas. So a contact ulcer can develop on the arytenoid cartilages right where the vocal folds join. And this is due to repeated forceful contact. So what a contact ulcer is, an ulcer is kind of death of tissue followed by the growth of a 
tissue mass or like a scab. So that's the granuloma. So contact ulcer granuloma at the site of that lesion. These can be because of that um, repeated forceful overuse or because of the acidic irritation of that laryngeal pharyngeal reflux. So those are disorders related to vocal abuse. We can also have neurogenic disorders. These result from some illness, damage, or disease to the neurological system um, or to the actual physical system. No, excuse me, neurogenic, always related to the neurological system. So we're going to talk about one, two, three, four types of these. Um, the first is vagus nerve lesions. Vagus, again, being V-A-G-U-S, not the, not the same as the city. Vagus nerve lesions. This is the 10th cranial nerve. Um, these usually result from damage during some surgical procedure some or from trauma or viral infections that impact the vagus nerve. They can result in vocal fold paralysis, usually affecting only one, one fold. And I will tell you a little story about uh, my experience with vagus nerve lesions. Um, in my very first year as an SLP, so in my CF year, I was just fresh out of grad school. I was working in um, a school district in Casa Grande, Arizona, and I had a uh, a parent who was actually a teacher at the school approached me about her junior high age daughter. Um, I also provided services at the junior high school, telling me that before winter break, so around Thanksgiving, her daughter had been very sick with a cold um, and hoarse voice. Daughter used her voice constantly. She sang in the choir, she was on ASB, she was a cheerleader, you know, used her voice all the time. And her voice really had gone away. So she's aphonic without voice. And it had not come back. Over Christmas break, they had taken her to university in Phoenix to the speech department there, um, where they had diagnosed her with, um, they'd used a term we don't use anymore. Um, we'll get to it in a, in a bit here in our in our discussion, but we don't use this term anymore. They had diagnosed her with hysterical aphonia. So in other words, saying there was some psychological reason um, that this teenager was no longer using her voice. And, um, but mom wasn't buying it <clears throat> and it was not getting better, even though they'd given her some things to do at home to try and help it get better. It was not getting better. And now we are a couple weeks past Christmas vacation, maybe maybe even into um, mid, mid late January. And, you know, I'm fresh out of graduate school. I'm like, Ooh, why am I going to contradict somebody at the university um, in Phoenix? So I do an assessment with her. And even though this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie at this. I'm, I'm, you know, really don't know. I, I also was not convinced that this was hysterical aphonia. There were just some things that told me that's not what this was. And, um, but I, but I didn't know what it was. So the first thing I did, this was before the age of the internet. I made a phone call to my professor, um, from graduate school who had um, been my professor in the area of voice disorders. And we talked about it. I had already dug through all of my notes um, from graduate school um, to try and figure out. And I knew what it wasn't. I knew it was not hysterical aphonia, but I wasn't sure what it was. And so she made a brilliant suggestion. Her suggestion was, why don't you take her to Boone? Now, there was a professor, head of the department, at the university in Tucson. Now, I'm in Casa Grande. Phoenix is to my north. Tucson is to my south. All right on Interstate 10. She said, why don't you take her to Boone? Dan Boone, not that Daniel Boone, but our Daniel Boone in, in speech. Um, Dan Boone was the expert on voice at that point. He'd written the textbooks. Um, developed all of the assessments. Um, I don't know if today you will still be um, using Dan Boone's textbooks, but I did. 
and I'm sure it's right behind me somewhere on that shelf. And so I did. I got permission from our school district for her mom and I to drive down. To, I called him first, obviously set up an appointment to drive down to the university in Tucson. And we went into the speech clinic there and Dan and a couple graduate students started doing an assessment um, on her on voice. Mid-assessment, Dan came back to mom and I while, she, while the young lady was not with us and said, I've called a friend of mine who is a neurologist um, in town and he is willing to see you right now if you drive over there. And he said to mom, I think this is a neurogenic origin and I need a neurologist to help make that diagnosis. So we got this young lady into the car and drove her to the neurologist's office where he did a screening. Right? There's our, our word screening. He did a quick screening of looking for some other neurological soft signs. So this unrelated to voice, you can you can screen for other neurological issues. Now, he didn't find any other neurological issues, um, but he did also agree with Dan that this was probably of neurogenic origin. Um, his actual thinking um, at the time was that this was very, very early onset multiple sclerosis. Thank God that is not what it turned out to be. What it turned out to be was a vagus nerve lesion. Um, what it turned out to be was that cold that she had had back at Thanksgiving was actually a viral infection that had settled on the 10th cranial nerve and was now impacting um, her use of her vocal folds. So with some really good medical intervention, thank God for modern medicine, um, within a few weeks, her voice was back and she didn't have any other problems with it. Okay, that's my big, long um, personal story about vagus nerve lesions. So the second type of neurogenic disorder is spasmodic dysphonia, um, also called spastic dysphonia. Um, and if you remember our terms from motor speech disorders, flaccid and spastic. Spastic means over, over use of muscle tone, muscle tension. There's just too much of it. Um, it's a disorder that affects the motor control of the larynx. So it will result in vocal spasms, intermittent voice stoppages. Um, it is a form of laryngeal dystonia. So the tone of the muscles is impacted. There are abnormal movements of the larynx. Um, the, this uh, di a differential diagnostic part of this is the person is going to have a very normal sounding whisper. So when voice is turned off, the person can whisper without any problem um, because they're not using their voice. A third type of neurogenic disorder is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So in ALS, the voice does deteriorate over time, as with all muscle function in the body. Vocal quality is going to be very soft and breathy, very low in pitch, low in loudness, um, very monotone sounding. Um, and this is because a very hypernasal. This is because all of the muscle systems involved in communication will be impacted, um, including those that are regulating na nasal versus oral resonance. And then the fourth um, neurogenic disorder is Parkinson's. Um, the voice is impaired because of this disease's impact on the respiratory and laryngeal systems. So voice is going to be um, pretty weak. Um, reduced loudness, very breathy, um, hoarseness, kind of monotone. This is also a progressive degenerative neurological disease. And then the next etiology is iatrogenic etiology. This is voice disorders, iatrogenic, let me spell that for you, I-A-T-R-O-G-E-N-I-C, iatrogenic this is voice disorders that result from surgery or other treatments. So in other words, during a surgical procedure, not related to the larynx, by the way, or some other medical procedure, the voice is damaged or the, the vocal structure is damaged in some way. 
nearly half of the impairments involving vocal cord movement are the result of iatrogenic etiology. Um, the acronym VFMI stands for Vocal Fold Movement Impairment. And it can result, for example, from spinal surgeries. Um, often when, we're, we're, when doctors are operating on the upper spine, they go in from the front. Um, any surgery that involves the chest or the thyroid in this upper area um, can result in vocal fold movement impairment. Um, intubation. We hear a lot about that in the news lately. The use of breathing machines, intubation can result in damage to the vocal folds, which will then result in issues with voice. Again, we save lives before we worry about that, um, but things that um, we have to use for respiratory support. Again, a personal story I have with that one. I did my um, one of my internships during graduate school at the University of, nope, yes, the University of Rochester Medical School's Hospital, Strong Memorial Hospital. And um, one of the, one of the advantages, I guess, but also one of the fear producing things that happens when you're doing um, an, an internship in a hospital setting, especially a teaching hospital, is that you sometimes get pulled into hospital rounds. Now, all of you who've watched medical shows that involve teaching hospitals or teaching staffs, um, you know what rounds are. It's when they take all the, the medical um, the medical students and pull them into a patient's, um, hold on, I gotta log in, pull them into a, pac a patient at bedside and um, they start asking them questions, right? Well, I, once in a while, I would get pulled into rounds if there was something voice involved or, or communication involved. And so I got pulled into rounds. This was in the outpatient clinic of a man who had, he was completely without voice. So aphonic, l larynx is intact. And um, the doctor wanted to know what I thought about it. Well, I didn't have a whole lot of thought about it at that point. I didn't know. I asked a few questions and... Um, it turned out that it was because during um, spinal surgery, there had been um, damage to the 10th cranial nerve, not damage to the um, vocal folds themselves, but damage to the 10th cranial nerve that caused paralysis of the vocal folds. So they um, ended up treating him with vocal fold injections. We'll talk about those when we get to the section on treatment. But back in those days, they injected Teflon into the vocal folds. We don't do that anymore. I assume it's because we have discovered that it's probably a bit toxic. Um, but I got pulled on two rounds. And this was, um, again, because of a surgical cause um, to the vocal folds. So let's talk a bit about vocal tics and Tourette syndrome. Vocal tics, by the way, can occur uh, as a disorder of their own. They are not always related to Tourette syndrome, but they also affect voice and voice quality. Um, they, all, they are sometimes one of the presenting symptoms of Tourette syndrome. And then another disorder called paradoxical vocal fold movement. There's no paralysis, there's no paresis, just which means um, weakness of or par partial paralysis, but the vocal folds close seemingly without warning when they should be opening. So during breathing, <laughs> um, it simulates choking or tightness in the throat. It can be perceived as an asthma attack. Um, it can be brought on by stress but um, often it can also have some physical contributions. These are listed in the text. I'm not gonna ask you to memorize those. Treatment always involves a medical team, but it does impact voice, which is why it's in our chapter. I think I am going to stop right there and we will finish the rest of this in class um, because I think you've heard enough from me in these videos. So when we get back, we will start talking about psychogenic disorders in class. All right, bye guys.